Manoj? Please start. So, good evening, everybody. A warm welcome to the prestigious Learn from the Legend series organized by NNF, India NNF Kerala chapter, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, Neonatology chapter, and NNF Trichu and IEP Trichu under the able leadership of our incoming uh, NNF president, Dr. V.C. Manoj, who won the national elections few days ago with a thumbing majority. I wish to congratulate him on this uh, great occasion. And I wish Thank you. to welcome the eminent faculty optimizing oxygenation in the first five minutes of life in preterm units by Professor Julie Oye from the University of New South Wales, Australia. To chair moderate this session, we have two eminent neonatologists. Dr. Saurabh Datta he is the professor of neonatology unit, PGI Chandigarh, and adjunct clinical professor, McMaster University, Canada. And we have uh, Dr. Prakash Manikot. He is the consultant neonatologist, Armed Force Hospital, Muscat, Omar, and he is the clinical lecturer in pediatrics, College of Medicine, Sultan Kabuz University, Oman, and a trainer in pediatrics and neonatology, Oman Medical Specialty Board. So thank you very much for joining the session. Over to Dr. V.C. Manoj. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Hello, everyone. Hearty welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on whichever part of the globe you are in. We had a short break for the elections of the National Neutral Forum India, and here we are back on track. Today, we have a very popular researcher as the legend of this month. She is also chair of the Pediatric Research Committee, Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Physicians, chair of Perinatal Substance Use Special Interest Group of Australia and New Zealand, and vice chair of the very popular Hippocrates Foundation. In fact, some of us had a good time together with her at the recent Hippocrates seminar at Bangalore earlier this month. Her research interests are in the use of oxygen for newborn restation, the topic of our lecture today. Also, she is an expert in neonatal abstinence syndrome and big data linkage. I have great pleasure to introduce a very good friend of mine, Professor Julie Oy. I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Julie. Oh, good. Oh, good. Thank you, a, Manoj. <laughs> a neonatologist at Royal Hospital for Women and, and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Su New South Wales, Australia. I'm extremely grateful to you, madam, for joining at this late hour of 1 a.m. at Sydney to deliver this lecture. Thank you so much for this. So very nice of you to accept our invitation to deliver at this very odd hour. In fact, one of the reasons, <laughs> as I was just now mentioning, for not having too many legends from the eastern side of India in this series. Thank you so much. Now, over to you, Julie. Um, thank you, Manoj. Um, I think you have to get rid of my picture before I can share my screen. Oh, Leah, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I certainly don't look like that now because it's 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. And again, congratulations on your win as uh, an NF president. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So without further ado, because it's 1 a.m. in the morning, good morning, everyone. Um, I couldn't say no to Manoj when he um, approached me in Hippocrates in Bangalore a couple of weeks ago, and he wanted me to speak again on uh, my work on oxygen um, and its use in the resuscitation or the, the respiratory support of preterm infants in the first few minutes of life. Um, 
And uh, because it's almost morning time, I thought I'll show you what our place looks like. This is outside my house. It's um, almost time for a swim. So I'll just keep going and uh, maybe I'll go for a swim after this talk. All right, so I'll get going. Um, when we first started on this study, um, it, there was a lot of, um, I guess, apprehension to what, uh, how important the subject could be because for many, many years, it was presumed that oxygen could only be good, don't interfere with it and use lots of it. And um, those of you um, as old as me will remember when you were training to uh, help, um, you know, look after babies when they were born, the very, very stern and old midwife will tell you, keep the babies pink with lots of oxygen. Okay, but then Ola Saltstead, um, my mentor here, came into the scene in the early 90s and showed for the first time that maybe sick newborn babies did not need 100% oxygen to breathe. And this seminal group of studies called the REST Air Studies was the first to randomize term and near term hypoxic infants to respiratory support with either air or 100% oxygen. These studies were seminal in showing that, first of all, oxygen may not be needed. And in work done by Peter Davis, shown here, and his team in Melbourne, in the first meta-analysis, that the use of air decreased the risk of death by up to 30% in hypoxic term infants. Subsequent work by Max Vento and also by Ola Salstad team showed us that this was probably because of reduced oxidative stress. So you would remember way back in 2006, the resuscitation guidelines rapidly changed. Before then, the standard approach was to use 100% oxygen to provide positive pressure ventilation for newborn infants if needed. However, after the work of Ola and of the meta-analysis produced by Peter Davis, it was suggested by ILCO and the other expert committees that room air could be used. However, oxygen had to be available if the baby did not improve by as little as one and a half minutes of life. In preterm infants, the direction was more cautious because we did not have any evidence but there was also increasing knowledge that premature infants were more susceptible to oxidant injury. So the advice then was to use oxygen with caution. What that meant in real life in the delivery suite was unknown. So remember the term infant studies done by Ola Sturzstedt used air or oxygen. They did not blend oxygen, and they did not monitor oxygen saturation, so SpO2, which is our standard practice nowadays. A couple of years later, from 2007, Jennifer Dawson, a clinical nurse consultant shown here, uh, working from Melbourne and Peter Davis's group, um, assessed normal healthy term infant oxygen saturations within the first 10 minutes of life. From almost 200 babies, Jennifer showed that the SpO2s of the healthy term infant did not reach more than 90% of what we would consider normal oxygen saturations for at least six minutes of life. They were not born pink. If the babies were more premature, that is between 32 to 36 weeks gestation, or what is known as a moderate to late preterm infant, these babies took slightly longer, more than seven to eight minutes to reach 90% oxygen saturations. If they were more premature, less than 32 weeks gestation, they took even longer. Note that these readings came from spontaneously breathing healthy infants. And in this graph here, this graph is derived from 12 babies. So we're basing our practice of titrating oxygen on 12 babies. So what happens to their oxygen saturations if we gave preterm infants 100% oxygen as we have been doing for many, many years? In this very, very brave study led by a group of um, researchers from Denmark, 
what we see here are different oxygen saturations in term healthy babies in blue and preterm babies about 28 weeks gestation provided with oxygen at birth in the green line and in air in the red line. As you can see, the babies who were provided respiratory support with air, shown in red, had SpO2s that sort of uh, tracked along the SpO2s of the healthy term infants. However, if they were given high amounts of oxygen as for standard practice at that time, the SpO2s were very high from about three minutes of life. There were only 12 babies in each group of um, infants. No baby died during resuscitation, which was important. But when the babies were admitted into the NICU, the ones who were given high amounts of oxygen, the ones in green there, had lower cerebral blood flow. They didn't know the meaning or the implications of this finding, but in animal studies at that time, lower cerebral blood flow was equated to an increased risk of death. So after Jennifer's work, the resuscitation guidelines, as you would remember, changed again in 2010. And in 2010, we were asked to adjust FiO2 to meet the preductal SpO2s shown in the um, blue box on the right here. And you would note that in this algorithm, oxygen has completely disappeared. We were asked to focus on maintaining heart rate and adjusting oxygen saturations. In 2015, an update came about again. And you would note here that oxygen has come back. So what happened? We were all extremely confused. In summary, the 2015 guidelines recommended that we used air to resuscitate term babies. There has been no evidence or no new evidence for using or not using air since the rest air studies. But for preterm babies, they suggested that we started resuscitation with anything varying from air or 0.21 FiO2 to 0.3 not to use FiO2 greater than 0.65 because of concerns of oxidative stress and to change the FiO2 to target normal term baby SpO2 levels as shown by Jennifer Dawson's healthy term baby graphs. However, if all else failed and the baby wasn't improving, use our pure oxygen. Recently, the guidelines were changed again in 2020, and there was nothing different. And why is that? Because we still haven't got new information on preterm babies. So the question is, what happens if we don't do what the guidelines tell us to do? But neonatologists are a very obedient lot. In 2015, we surveyed more than 600 clinicians from 25 countries. And more than three quarters of them said that they would initiate stabilization of a preterm infant with FiO2 below 40%. Almost none of them would use more than 60% to start resuscitation and all will target SpO2s recommended by the guidelines. So for those of you who actually work at resuscitation real life babies, you would know how difficult it is to adjust your oxygen blender if you had one to target your SpO2s if you had an oximeter in the delivery room. There were four very brave people right at the end there you can see that said that they would use 100% oxygen because they didn't have blenders. And I can imagine a lot of people would have that in real life. So that led us to develop the torpedo study, which stood for targeted oxygen in the resuscitation of preterm infants. This study was developed in 2006 based on, an, uh, um, on, on the change in recommendation for the guidelines in 2005. We wanted to determine if the recommendations to use air 
to resuscitate preterm or term infants, reduce death or major disability at two years compared to 100% oxygens. We focus on babies below 32 weeks instead of term infants because uh, we felt that there was um, quite strong proof at that time that air decreased risk of death in hypoxic term infants. At that time, in 2006 to 2007, we didn't have normal SpO2 um, ranges in healthy babies. So we plucked this pre-specified SpO2 targets out of the air, and we suggested that FiO2 in this randomized controlled trial should be changed to meet SpO2s less than 65% before five minutes and less than 80% after five minutes. So we were very ambitious and we calculated that almost 1,900 babies in total were required to show a 20% reduction in the relative risk of the primary outcome, which was a composite of death and major disability at two years. This, however, the timeline shows our sad trajectory. As you can see here, the resuscitation guidelines changed for the first time in 2005. We developed the study concept in 2007, we received a bit of money in 2009, and the resuscitation guidelines changed again between 2010 and 2015, which unfortunately coincided with our recruitment phase. As a result of the guidelines change, no one wanted to join the study. They were too scared to use 100% oxygen. Recruitment was so slow that the Data and Safety Management Committee recommended that we stop recruitment at 292 patients, which was 15% of our target population, uh, because there was no way we could have reached 1,900 babies within the century. However, they suggested that we report immediately on short-term outcomes as the primary outcome would have taken two more years to ascertain. So this is our flow chart. Out of three countries, we had more than 6,000 eligible babies, and, but we could only randomize 292. Two were withdrawn by their neonatologists after the parents consented because the neonatologists were scared that they would land in the 100% arm. There was such an uh, attitude towards pure oxygen in those days. So we randomized about 145 babies to each arm, and this graph shows the oxygen saturations in the first 10 minutes of life. On the left axis is the SpO2, and on the bottom axis is the minutes of life of the baby. The black line represents the babies in the arm that was randomized to 100% oxygen, and the bottom gray line, the babies who were randomized to air. As you can see, the SpO2s of the babies who were randomized to air, but who had the FiO2 adjusted, were significantly lower than babies who were randomized initially to pure oxygen. However, by the time the babies reached seven to eight minutes of life, there was no difference in their SpO2s. However, if you superimpose the SpO2s recommended by ILCOR and other expert committees based on term healthy infant levels, you can see here that the babies who were given 100% oxygen met this uh, expected SpO2s for the whole 10 minutes of resuscitation, whereas the babies who were given air did not meet these targets until the seventh to eight minutes of life. We divided our cohort into babies who were more mature on the right side here, more than 28 weeks gestation who were expected to have better lungs and babies less than 28 weeks gestation on the left who were expected to have worse lungs. And we found that their SpO2s were very different. In the more mature babies, the babies who were given 100% oxygen had SpO2s that exceeded recommended targets. However, in babies who were more immature on the left box, those who were given SP, uh, um, those who were given pure oxygen had SpO2s that met the recommended SpO2 targets. This suggested that uh, babies who are more immature may have needed more oxygen to reach the recommended targets. 
However, no baby died in the delivery room. And that was pretty good, we guess. But in the post hoc hypothesis generating uh, only analysis, we found an unexpected increase in the babies um, who were given um, initial resuscitation with air and who were less than 28 weeks gestation. These were the most immature babies. We found that the babies who were given air and who were less than 28 weeks gestation had almost a four times risk of death compared to babies who were given 100% oxygen. Note that this was not a pre-specified analysis and was only marginally statistically significant because we didn't reach our sample size. What was also important to note was that no infant above 29 weeks gestation died. So the question was, does starting with lower FiO2 really made a difference to the babies? To date, we have 11 RCTs so far that have looked at this question. Lower with a starting FiO2 of less than 0.3 compared to higher with an FiO2 of more than 0.6. No study has looked at an initial FiO2 between 0.3 to 0.4, which from our survey is what most clinicians would normally start resuscitation of preterm babies with. So we pulled all these uh, studies together in a meta-analysis and to make things short, what we found was that uh, regardless of whether resuscitation was started with lower or higher oxygen, the outcome for death was not different. The outcome for death was also not different if the babies were less than 29 weeks gestation, regardless of what level of FiO2 you started resuscitation with. Similarly, the outcomes for common complications such as BPD, shown here, ROP, NEC, or IVH, was also not different. So, was that it? Was that the only difference between FiO2s? <clears throat> so, what about SpO2? This is the other part of the equation for oxygenation in our delivery room. I'll take you back to the SpO2 targets that you're all very familiar with. This is the most commonly used SpO2 targets for the first 10 minutes of life from the NRP. And focus on the five minute target of 80 to 85%. Because unless you're incredibly proficient and superhuman, by the time you get a decent reading on the preterm baby at resuscitation, it would probably be at least two to three minutes of life. One of our fellows, Alex Wilson, did a survey a couple of years ago, um, and he asked the major um, expert committees around the world what their SPO2 targets were. Now, note that this was almost um, five to six years ago. But at the time, out of all the resuscitation committees, what he found was that these SPO2 recommendations varied wildly. Look at the five-minute target. So the American Heart Association recommended 80 to 85% at five minutes. However, if you came from Finland, the recommended SPO2s could be as low as 70% and in Australia and New Zealand, as high as 90%. The RCTs that we're all basing our practice on all had very different SPO2 targets. And this was because most of them, except for three, were developed uh, before Jennifer Dawson's work on healthy term babies. And you, you can see here the five minute SPO2 targets for each of these studies range from as low as 75% to up to 95%. So when we pulled all these studies together in an individual patient data meta-analysis, what we found was that only one quarter of the babies in these studies, which were conducted under strict randomized controlled trial conditions, let alone daily clinical practice, could reach their study targets. However, they were two and a half times more likely to reach that magic SpO to 80% by five minutes if they were started on the higher oxygen arm. What we found from this individual patient data meta-analysis, IPD for short, was that babies with SpO2s of less than 80% at five minutes 
had lower heart rates by about 8 beats per minute. Not a big deal, you would say. However, babies with an SpO2 of less than 80% at 5 minutes were almost two or more, more than two and a half times more likely to die before hospital discharge. We are uncertain whether this was a cause or an effect because did the sick babies die because they were sick anyway or because we didn't give them enough oxygen? Also for the survivors, what happened to them? Remember Torpedo, our aim was to look at the composite of neurodevelopmental outcomes at two years and survival. And out of our study, out of our study patients that were randomized, we um, had almost 200, more than 200 babies that we found as survivors. And this is the outcome. So what we found was that there was no difference in the primary outcome of death or major disability at two years, whether the babies were initially resuscitated with air or pure oxygen. However, digging deeper, we found that the babies with an SpO2 of less than 80% at five minutes in the torpedo study had a significantly higher risk of death or major disability. And this was particularly evident in the babies who were above 28 weeks gestation. And this result was carried by the increased number of babies with disability. So what we found from the torpedo study was that infants with an SpO2 of less than 80% at five minutes were significantly more likely to die or be disabled than those with an SpO2 of more than 80%, regardless of how much oxygen they start, were started resuscitation on. What we also found was that the Bailey three scores of these babies were higher if their five minute SpO2 was above 80%. And this particularly affected the more mature babies above 28 weeks gestation. Remember, we could not um, look at this. This is, could be considered um, a very interim analysis because the torpedo study could not recruit to its um, sample size. So we pulled other studies that also examine neurodevelopmental outcomes after randomizing babies to low or high oxygen. The first was the Denise Rook study from the Netherlands that looked at um, babies below 32 weeks randomized to 0.3 or 0.6 FiO2. Nuria Boronet study from Spain that looked at babies below 29 weeks gestation, again, randomized to 0.3 and 0.6 FiO2. And then the torpedo study, looking at babies below 32 weeks randomized to 0.21 or air or 1.0 or pure oxygen. Individually, each of these studies showed no evidence of difference in the composite of death and neurodevelopmental outcomes. However, we pulled the studies in a meta-analysis to determine whether lower or higher oxygen made a difference to long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes. And this is a very complex showchart, but look at the yellow boxes on the right. We had a total of 411 babies that were followed up to two years in these three studies, and a total of 377 who had Bailey uh, tests examined. So very briefly, what we found from these three studies was that whether you started resuscitating the babies with lower or higher initial FiO2, made no difference to their risk of disability or death. And it had no effect on the risk of disability in survivors. However, again, uh, consistently, five-minute SpO2 was important. If the five-minute SpO2 was more than 80%, it was associated with a decreased risk of disability and death. And this was particularly evident in boys boys seem to be more sensitive to this effect. This graph shows the mean study group's cognitive scores. So the mean cognitive scores for this entire population was 97.8, as measured by the blue line there. Blue box, very traditional, represents the boys. Pink box represents the girls. As you can see here, the highest cognitive scores were in the more mature girls who were started with 
higher oxygen at resuscitation. But the lowest cognitive scores were from the more mature boys who were initially given less oxygen for their resuscitation. Unfortunately, many questions still remain. We now use a lot of different techniques to resuscitate our babies since torpedo was done. Primary uh, of this is delayed cord clamping and the use of different levels of oxygen. So Praveen Chandrasekharan from uh, Buffalo in New York is um, a world leader in preterm animal, especially lamb studies. And what Praveen did was that he looked at several um, lamb models, preterm lamb models, and resuscitated the hypoxic model with different levels of oxygen, 100%, 60%, and 30%, and titrated the oxygen according to NRP targets. And what he found was that lambs who were given either 100% or 60% oxygen achieved the primary outcome of an SpO2 of 80% better than babies who were started, or baby lambs who were started resuscitation with the 30% arm. He added on delayed cord clamping in an asphyxiated preterm lamb model and found that brief 100% oxygen exposure in the delayed cord clamping model, first of all, made no difference to oxidative stress and achieved a heart rate better in the babies who were given 100% oxygen. In human infants, Jana Decker's group in the Netherlands has led the way in revolutionizing the use of 100% in preterm infant resuscitation. Although a lot of work needs to be done, what um, nascent studies show is that 100% oxygen may improve respiratory effort in preterm babies. A very small study led by Yana, 52 infants, showed that giving 100% oxygen to preterm babies led to higher minute volumes, tidal volumes, and a higher mean inspiratory flow rate. There was a shorter duration of hypoxemia as shown in our various studies um, that I stud, uh, discussed before. And importantly, no difference in the duration of hyperoxemia, possibly because FiO2 was adjusted. And there was also no difference in oxidative stress markers, um, notably of prostaglandin F2 alpha. <clears throat> The infants, interestingly, also showed increased diaphragmatic activity, or <clears throat> which represented increased respiratory effort. And the question here was, does 100% or higher oxygen levels immediately after birth stimulate breathing activity in preterm infants? So this leads us to what the study that I'm currently doing, which is torpedo part two, or torpedo 3060. So in India, um, Dr. Kishore Kumar from the Cloud9 Hospitals is the lead investigator. And in this study, we aim to answer whether FiO2 of 60% representing the high arm is um, superior or equivocal to an initial FiO2 of 0.3 representing the low arm to change the primary outcome of survival free from major brain injury in very preterm infants below 29 weeks gestation. In Australia, um, sorry, so assuming that one third of the infants will not survive or survive with brain injury at 36 weeks, we calculated that almost 1,500 infants in, each arm, uh, in both arms will be required to show an 8% difference in outcomes. What is exciting is in Australia, in Malaysia and in the Cloud9 hospitals, we have received approval for consent waiver or deferred consent. And this has allowed us to rapidly recruit and we have passed a halfway mark, thank goodness. Um, we have sites in the US, in Spain, in Singapore, and in negotiation, Thailand, Indonesia, and China. Um, and um, these sites are now currently recruiting under informed consent. So it'd be very interesting to see what types of babies we recruit to both types of consent processes in this study. 
Um, so this takes us to my last line, a few minutes left for question. Um, the question whether oxygen in the first few minutes of life makes a difference to the outcomes in preterm babies, unfortunately, cannot be answered just yet. So the answer is maybe. Until we know better, regardless of what FiO2 you start on, try to target a minimum SpO2 of 80% by five minutes. This will mean that you will need to invest in oxygen blenders and pulse oximeters in your delivery room. And I think this would be the minimum investment you do if you provide care to very preterm infants. We still don't know what initial FiO2 is best or whether SpO2 targets is a fit for all infants. And to find out more, Please help us by joining the Torpedo 3060 study. I think this would be my last slide, and thank you for listening. I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Julie, for an excellent uh, talk as usual. Now, uh, I would request the moderators of today, uh, Professor Saurabhata and Dr. Prakash Maniko, to kindly take over. Thank you, Julie, for tackling a very, you know, fundamental question, which has remained unresolved for so many years. It's both topical and contentious, and I love the way you navigated through this, uh, you know, uh, minefield of uh, controversies and problems that um, are there with resuscitation of a newborn, especially at one a.m. At, at, at two a.m. <laughs> <laughs> at two a.m. <laughs> Additional credit to you. <laughs> So uh, I, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, really come out from your talk is, you know, we are fond of this uh, saying that children are not just little adults. Uh, I think it just shows that uh, preterm children are not just smaller versions of term children, and that extremely preterm children are not smaller versions of moderate to you know, very preterm uh, children. There are, there are, they are all different groups and have to be handled very differently. And I think that's one thing that really came out of your talk. And the other thing that uh, I really like the way you emphasize, there is a difference between targeting FiO2 and targeting SpO2. And, and the two are not the same thing. And when you look at data uh, in, in these two different, from these two different viewpoints, you end up with very different uh, conclusions. And that possibly it is the SPO2, you know, the business end of things that one should be looking at rather than the delivery end of things uh, when we are talking about resusc resuscitating newborns. I'm sure there would be uh, questions for you. And uh, I'll first start taking questions from the Q&A box. And I would request all the participants to quickly write up their questions in the Q&A box. Please avoid writing it in the chat box. So if we take the first question. It says, hi, ma'am. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, what is the recommended target SPO2 for term and preterm babies admitted to the NICU? I think uh, Gitanjali is asking about target SPO2s, not at the time of resuscitation, per se, perhaps, but in general in the NICU. So uh, what is the policy that you follow in your unit? Julie? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Gitanjali, and great to meet someone from Bhutan. This is amazing. Um, so the um, recommended targets for preterm babies in the NICU are based mostly on the NEOPROM group of studies, the five studies that encompass the BOOST, two, boost 1 and BOOST 2 studies, the COT studies, the Canadian Oxygen Targeting Studies, um, which for more than 5,000 babies show that targeting between, I think it's 93 to 91 to 95% um, decreases risk of mortality. Um, unfortunately, if you were a nurse in the NICU, what Peter Dargaville's group from Hobart has shown is that this is a difficult process. And some babies might need the FiO2 adjusted more than 40 times in 24 hours to meet these targets. So um, I think the future of our practice may be automated oxygen control, which again is a, um, an algorithm and a, um, I guess a concept led by Peter's team in Hobart. 
So it'd be very interesting to see whether this automated oxygen control that in, can improve outcomes for preterm babies from as soon as they're born. In term babies, there are no specific targets and I guess uh, they're less, they're more resistant to the oxidative stress problems that you see in uh, preterm babies. And I would suggest the normal SpO2s that you would um, uh, use for uh, any, any healthy infant above 95%. Uh, carrying that question further, Julie, uh, would you be changing these targets beyond a certain gestation or does it remain no. constant? And until we know better, um, the 80% to 80, 80 to 85% is our range. We have no evidence to show that either different targets, higher or lower, is better or worse. Okay, the next question, I'm not sure whether I really understand it. it says high oxygen in patients in early minute of life exposed to ROP more. Sure, I guess um, that means that if they have high oxygen uh, SPO2, uh, there's more, they have more ROP. Risk yeah. of ROP, yes. Uh, and another question by Gitanjali, the recommended 80% target of SPO2 at five minutes of life is for preterm infants less than how many weeks of gestation? Um, that would be uh, for all babies, Gitanjali. That's the recommended target for the NRP. Yeah, the next question is from uh, Vishal Vishnu Tewari. Is the Topito trial, I guess this is the 3060 trial that uh, Vishal is referring to, looking at cerebral blood flow in preterm neonates in the delivery room also, since the basic premise was that reduced blood, cerebral blood flow in babies who are given pure oxygen has uh, deleterious consequences? That's a great question, Vishal. Uh, some of our hospitals are taking advantage of that by um, looking at their own sub-studies. So one of the groups uh, in Westmead Hospital in Sydney will be looking at NEARS uh, and cerebral blood flow for their babies who are admitted uh, after the torpedo intervention. So hopefully they'll have some results for us. Mm -hmm. And the next question is by Nargis. It is for extremely preterm infants at more than 40 weeks of postmenstrual age with BPD in the NICU. I can see that there are a lot of questions about uh, you know, older kids in the NICU. Uh, what is the SpO2 target? And I think that's a little okay. similar to what you answered earlier. Yeah. I love this question because that's my next baby now. I'm looking at uh, SpO2s uh, with variable oximetry. Uh, so if anyone is interested, email me, please. So unfortunately, we only have SpO2 targets for babies up to 36 weeks. So if you look at literature, when you send a baby home on oxygen or a baby after 36 weeks with BPD, we do not know what the best targets are. Um, and I think this is something that we really need to look at because our lungs are getting worse and we may be um, exposing these babies to either too much or too little oxygen, running the risk of um, cardiorespiratory issues later on, like pulmonary hypertension. Okay, the, there are two questions from Bahari Mohammed. What do you think of the COT trial in regards to the lower or higher oxygen uh, targets? Yeah, I mean, the two questions are related to the same thing. Yes, I think, again, um, the COT trial is part of the Neoprom meta-analysis led by Lisa Eski, and it's provided us with the uh, pros and cons of the two different spo 2 So you target too low in your units uh, with a high incidence of NEC, you increase NEC. You target too high in your units with a high incidence of ROP, you increase ROP. So we still do not know what the best spo 2 target is for babies above 36 weeks gestation, unfortunately. Hopefully, we will uh, get some studies out, out from that soon. Okay, Whipple asks the question from the point of view of retinopathy of prematurity, what is the target oxygen? Oh, what is oxygen? Sorry. Sure. Um, what is the oxygen target? How to manage? I think it's 
probably with reference to retinop ROP, what is the oxygen target? Yes, that's right. So uh, again, uh, same, same with the new PROM studies. Uh, what they found was that if you, it depends on what your unit is like. So if your unit has high NEC rates, if you target low, you increase your NEC rates and your risk of death. If your units have high ROP rates, you target high, you increase your retinopathy rates. So um, they, this is probably beyond the scope of this talk because this talk is looking at five minutes of life. And what we have found in this small cohort of patients in the first five minutes of life, the SpO2 target does not have the power to show changes in uh, ROP yet. Hopefully, we will provide you with the answer when we complete the Torpedo 3060 study, uh, coupled with George Moltz's high-low study in Canada. Okay. Um... There should be more questions for a hot topic like this. <laughs> uh, they're all, they're all okay. with the Thanksgiving Day uh, celebrations in the Western part. Uh, oh, yeah, it's Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yes, turkey and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, probably that is why we find a little uh, uh, shortage. Okay, I, would, I was expecting more questions. I mean, people can still come in with their questions. I don't see any in the chat box. Oh, no, just go either. easy on me. It's very late. <laughs> uh, I would then hand over to my co-chair person to give his comments and uh, questions from the moderators, if any. Uh, thank you, Professor Saurav Datta. Uh, greatly appreciate the scholarly presentation and thank you very much, Professor Julie. Uh, optimization of oxygen in the first five minutes is an important part of presentation of extreme preterms in search for the right answers. Uh, before I look for questions, let me share a question from my colleagues back home. Prolonged hypoxia or hyperoxia, which is more harmful in the first five minutes. Which is more harmful? I think that's the golden question. I cannot answer that yet, but it's looking that, um, uh, the, the definition of hypoxia or hyperoxia in a very preterm baby still needs to be elucidated um, because what's hyperoxic and what's hypoxic in a term baby might not be the same as a preterm baby. Um, at the moment, we are finding out that this SpO2 and Dr. Gitanjali says that they cannot regulate FiO2s in their delivery rooms in Bhutan. SpO2 might be the key regardless of how hard it is to reach or target this SpO2s. So um, we do not know whether hyper or hypoxia is more dangerous at the moment. Okay. Uh, relating to that, rather than chasing a magical figure to start with, can we think of how to titrate oxygen in a better way so that you reach the optimum target of 80% and heart rate of 100 by 5 minutes? Yes. So how do we target? I know when uh, all of us have been to delivery rooms where, you know, things are flying everywhere and you, 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 you can't, you, you sometimes forget to change the oxygen dial, right? Um, I think the answer would probably, uh, as Ajoy Garch says there, would be closed loop FiO2 uh, control. And Peter Dargaville has published pilot data on the use of closed loop control at delivery room resuscitation. So it is a possible um, uh, way to improve our oxygen targeting, regardless of the implications of that oxygen targeting. Uh, are there more studies regarding that automated uh, closed loop in resuscitation in control yes. trials? Yes, there is. Uh, there is no randomized control trial. So what we hope to do is to incorporate Peter's uh, algorithm. Uh, he's uh, just, Hobart has just recently joined the torpedo study. So hopefully we will have a sub-study where the babies are, um, you know, have their FiO2 controlled by this uh, algorithm. Uh, Nargis uh, Patan wants to know, so for 36 weeks, target is NICU is more than 95%. Oh, that is that is a loaded question. We don't know, Nargis, uh, because the COD, the boost, um, all those studies only look up to 36 weeks. Okay. Uh, Maria is asking, what is the recommended time in the first minutes of life in a patient who is unfortunately born 
with a fetal probably heart rate less than 50 for neonatal resuscitation. Uh, question out of context, but thank you. <laughs> That's okay. Um, out of context is okay, but I'm not sure what you mean, Maria. Um, no, if a heart rate, if a baby is born with a heart rate of less than 50 or fetal, I don't know, she means FC, born with a fetal, I don't know. Um, okay, so uh, we should presume it's a heart rate less than 50. Okay, heart rate is less than 50 doesn't sound too great. Um, so Vishal Kapadia has looked at our IPD data as well and has shown that babies who take a longer time to reach a heart rate of more 100 or more has also an increased risk of death or IVH regardless of what their initial FiO2 was. So I think for the heart rate, the magic number is still 100. Okay. Uh, Bahari Mohamad again asks, from your experience, which device do you find uh, quicker in you know, obtaining SPO2 signals? Uh, Bahari, we only have experience with the Massimo um, using the Rainbow uh, probe. So we, uh, I don't have any experience with the other brands, unfortunately. So I think Mary also asked me a similar question. Which one gives the fastest result? And you're so sweet, an extraordinary presentation at 2 a.m. Lovely. Yeah. So Mary, we have uh, the Massimo uh, oximeters. Uh, we use different forms of different types, the red five, sevens, whatever, whatever. They all use the same technology. Okay, if, is it better to start high or low and then titrate? Aha, uh -huh. I, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. Because, because if the heart rates are lower, many of us who find in practice that they take a longer time to reach that uh, target of saturation. People who have been in the business for a long time, if you have a low heart rate and you, you need the more time to pick up. That could be right. I, I, I don't know, really. So I'm not supposed to say anything because I'm, my, my mind is still supposed to be open because I'm the PI of the torpedo. Uh, but there is increasing evidence that maybe starting higher might um, achieve your target SpO2s and heart rates faster. I'm not sure. So hopefully you can all uh, contact me and um, join the study. <laughs> okay. uh, Manoj, you have some burning questions about this hot topic. No, one, uh, I mean, uh, there is a practical uh, po question that most of the NEOs have, which has come up, uh, I just uh, posted in the chat box. You want me to read it for you? Uh, it's okay. Which one? Uh, uh -huh. That's actually Please. beyond the topic of, I mean, the scope of today's uh, okay. uh, discussion. But okay. then that topic has come, uh, the question has come in various forms in the other platforms as well. Okay. Yes, we have many questions. Yeah, I think. Okay, so irrespective of gestation, what should the saturation targets and alarm targets be? I, I think uh, what uh, we need to bear in mind when we're looking after very preterm babies is that they change, the physiology changes. So the first five minutes of life may be different to the second minutes of life, which may be different to when the baby goes in as an ICU and after he develops or doesn't develop BPD. So all of these are, is a moving fest. I think oxygen is a moving target throughout the life of the baby in your NICU. So um, a lot of work needs to be done. And the problem with us neonatologists is that we latch onto many shiny new things and we tend to be very entrenched and we lose our equipoise very quickly. And this is what happened when air was suggested as an alternative way back in 2005. Everyone became very scared of oxygen. Um, and the history of oxygen use in neonatologies has been littered, as you know, with a lot of um, U-turns. So initially, we stopped using oxygen because of ROP. And then we found out that if you don't give the babies oxygen, they die. And then um, it goes round and round in circles. So I think we have to be careful not to lose equipoise for whatever question that has a major knowledge gap. Uh, Raj Gupta mentions that uh, putting the SAT probe first and then the machine, and then switch on the machine gives a better results. 
is there a real difference? I thought it, it makes the same. Yes, apparently it does. So um, what we do is, uh, as Raj says, we pop the probe on first and then turn it on. Yeah. So okay. um, it, I guess in real life, Raj, it doesn't make that much difference because it's a matter of like a few, like 30 seconds or something. Um, but um, we don't have enough data on the SPO to below five minutes to make any real comments on outcomes. Uh, what we have are considered uh, more consistent data on the five minute readings. So um, if your team were resuscitation, resuscitating the babies, I would suggest that they focus on the five minute reading. Uh, Professor Julie, you have any advice how to titrate uh, the oxygen better and faster for those with low heart rates, which is a common uh, occurrence in extreme preterms? Yeah, I mean, I mean, all of the nurses who can actually change the FiO2 so quickly, right? Um, look, we go by steps of 10 to 20 percent each time, um, every 30 to 60 seconds. Um, so, um, no, actually, it's all guesswork at the moment. So hopefully we'll get our IPD, our individual patient data, look at how fast the uh, investigators or the researchers are changing the FiO2 and we will be able to provide an answer about how the, what is the optimum change to meet targets. So Julie, currently there is no, uh, uh, currently there is no right way to titrate how fast or how slow. No. Okay, thank you. Over to Julie, can, Julie, can I ask a, a question before you uh, fall asleep? Go to so, a coma. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, uh, uh, this is regarding the respiratory diseases that preterm babies may have or not have and the severity of res respiratory diseases. So does the severity of the disease, uh, you know, is it a covariate in all these outcomes that you're looking at? And will you be looking at the respiratory diseases that they suffer from and adjust for those respiratory conditions? Number two, is it possible that your choice of the uh, in oxygen targets may affect the respiratory disease itself? I mean, is it that the respiratory disease is itself an outcome rather than a covariable of, uh, like for, in for instance, in the torpedo study? That was the major question that we had. Was it um, that the babies didn't do well because they were sick in the first place or because we didn't give them the oxygen that they needed? because um, oxidative stress or hypoxic stress can occur very quickly, as you know. Um, the cells can die within a couple of minutes of not getting enough or too much oxygen. So um, in the washout, we will look at the lung disease they have, um, how much oxygen they needed, what type of, whether it's HMD, TTN, or whatever they had, and then do a deep dive into the impact of their primary presenting problems on the outcome. So at the moment, we do not know whether it's the child or the oxygen that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, are there studies looking at the oxygen targets uh, for preterm based on specific gestational age and the impact of cord management? Yes, Anu Katria has done a retrospective um, review on the amount of uh, um, the amount the the, the ability of the child to reach the SPO2 targets based on delayed cord clamping versus uh, immediate cord clamping. And um, he's found that babies who had delayed cord clamping were able to reach the SPO2 targets faster. Uh, Vipul is asking, what about uh, PPHN babies in preterms? Do not know, sorry Vipul, we do not have the um, data yet, the clinical data yet, to elucidate these differences. Uh, remember that all the studies that were done before, the 11 RCTs that were done before, including Torpedo 1, were informed consent studies. So this means that the uh, researchers had to ask for informed consent, and most of the babies who were recruited into these studies were a lot better or a lot healthier than babies who missed out on being randomized because the mother, for example, was very sick or delivered very quickly. So we hope to see a difference um, in our consent waiver babies because we would be able to um, 
recruit all types of babies. So we do not have enough information on the preterm babies who had pulmonary hypertension. Thank you, thank you. Can I ask uh, two, three questions if it's okay? Uh, one is uh, uh, regarding the Dawson's nomogram, uh, like uh, elegant study, but very small number and then preterm, uh, not, uh, not sure whether it's applicable to a preterm neonate. So do we have anything better than that to recommend as of now? Okay, the other study that was done was a group of babies um, from Mexico that informed uh, partially on the um, ILCO guidelines for the SPO2 normograms. So at the moment, we do not have normograms ab above and beyond Jennifer Dawson's 12 babies. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a project waiting for someone to do. Probably we may not have another one in the right right now. Now the uh, another two, uh, two more things. Quick uh, rapid fire. I'll just ask you. I'll not waste much of your time. Uh, do you change your targets after blood transfusion? Does changing fetal uh, HB to adult HB as a different binding capacity oh. than the baby? No, that that will probably be too clinically confusing for the practitioners. Um, we would leave leave our target spo 2s as is. That is a very good question. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, another uh, concept that you mentioned uh, is uh, automation. Uh, what is the expo uh, experience of automation in the delivery room? Automation of oxygen saturation targeting. Because yeah. whatever the machines that we have, this facility, they are all NIC machines. And then do we, has anybody tried the automation setting targets and then doing that in the delivery room? Yes, of course. Um, Peter Dargaville again in um, uh, Hobart, Australia, uh, and his team have the algorithm that uh, allows in um, automated oxygen control right from the delivery room. Um, I shall put the. Um, am I allowed to to write on the text box? Yes, yes, I uh, think. Yeah. I don't know how to write on the text box, but anyway, if you if you Google Dargaville uh, P, right, he's got the he's is the leader of automated oxygen control, and his algorithm is incorporated into the SLE ventilator, and it's called the Oxygeny Automated Oxygen Control Software. Um, uh, the University of Tübingen holds the patent on the the closed loop automated oxygen control. And the SLE ventilator, I sound like a, a ventilator rep, so they can pay me commission. It can deliver um, um, ox automated oxygen control with various forms of ventilation, including CPAP, high flow, and invasive ventilation. I think we have exhausted most of the questions. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, if, if there's any other questions, just feel free to uh, email Dr. Manoj, who will get me. Done. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Julie, very much. Oh, you're very welcome. That, uh, Great to see all of you excellent, guys. Excellent uh, uh, presentation and handling all the questions so well. Yeah, I think oh, uh, one of the God. reasons why you know, you weren't deluged with questions is because you'd already covered most of the stuff during your uh, talk. You're very sweet. I don't think so, though. I think they're just like asleep like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy Thanksgiving to the Americans in the audience. And um, again, congratulations, Dr. Manoj. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I should really thank both the moderators, uh, Professor Saurabh Dutta and Dr. Prakash Maniko. You have done a marvelous job, actually. It is such a, uh, uh, I mean, uh, and, uh, actually difficult task to moderate. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, I really want to thank uh, uh, Professor Julio. It was, uh, again, you know, like I can't uh, thank you enough for keeping, I mean, asking you to be awake at the very odd hour 
and then where uh, and then most of us would be sleeping 1 am 2 am and then <laughs> like then delivering such a fantastic uh, lecture with all the vigor that you have and then amazing lecture as usual of yours so if uh, before we wind up uh, I, uh, any concluding remarks from the moderators or uh, the speaker No, I think I would just reiterate what Julie had said right in the beginning that, you know, uh, oxygen is a drug uh, which has to be handled carefully. And we as neonatologists have this tendency to behave like pendulums. Uh, you know, once, uh, uh, you know, we start getting evidence in one direction, we sort of go whole hog in that direction without pausing to think that maybe there are a lot of lot more nuances to these uh, recommendations and what meet the eye uh, at first look. So uh, that's all that I have to say as a concluding remark. I can only agree with uh, Professor Datta. Uh, there are no simple quick answers for complex problems. And I admire Professor Julie for making this presentation in a very simple and clear and easily understandable manner. Uh, so nice of you. Thank you. Thank you again, once again, Professor. We'd love so, to hear from you more often. Uh, we, we would before midnight. You, before midnight. <laughs> we would definitely call you, but not at this odd hour, probably at a decent hour. And then probably, like as I was mentioning the other day, we would love to have you in person here for our next conference. We would definitely get in touch with you regarding I got that. my Indian visa. All good. All good. <laughs> Uh, All right. So finally, uh, I would uh, like to express uh, our team's uh, sincere gratitude to all of you uh, respected attendees. We have uh, 9,300 uh, registrations who are uh, viewing this at different time zones. Uh, only very few are today, you know, right now present here. But then uh, thank you all for engaging this uh, series. We are in the third year. Uh, and now we continue with this series. So uh, some uh, 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 some of the interesting concepts like uh, uh, the saying that you are what your mother and even your grandmother ate during the pregnancies, all these newer concepts in epigenetic and human microbiome projects. Uh, uh, all these are probably going to be touched upon in our next lecture that is going to be on Monday. Mm, it's a different deviating from our usual Thursday. It's going to be a Monday. And uh, it's going to uh, be in uh, on December 12th at the same time, 7.30 uh, p.m. I would welcome all of you. Uh, what's new in nutrition and brain development in neonates? It's by uh, the legend of the month, uh, Professor uh, Michael Jorif from University of Minnesota, USA. So uh, I would invite all of you to join that. And, and thank you all for joining today. Until then, thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. See you. See you. Bye.